the non-stem bulk here and the stem bulk here. So what you get is a two to one female to male uh, ratio you know, of popularity, if you like, of non-stem subjects. So girls are choosing non-stem subjects and boys in the same, you know, two to one choosing a STEM subject. Um, and you start to see it. Um, these ones aren't really are a bit complicated, so perhaps I'll go over these quite quickly. Um, but right across, so this is the types of universities. So right across the more selecting or the more recruiting uh, types of courses, um, you'll see that males have a significant, that's the sort of khaki block, that's male STEM um, acceptances uh, out of all the um, acceptances um, for those particular groups compared to the orange block at the bottom um, is, uh, is the female um, STEM acceptances. <coughs> and then if you look at by tariff, so the khaki bit again is the boys, so what you see there is that right across the types of tariff scores, so quite low achieving boys are still being accepted at quite um, high rates uh, in STEM subjects, whereas the girls are much lower in the lower tariff scores and only begin to creep up um, for um, the higher uh, tariff scores. So, um, so just to try and put, sorry about my horrible charts, but so I think what I'm saying here, is, so STEM is traditionally seen as a kind of more difficult, uh, more difficult subject, um, but actually being more difficult also makes them less popular. So they tend to have lower requirements overall um, than, than non-STEM subjects. And so those are favouring uh, lower achieving boys who are twice as likely to apply. So I think that's why you get that strange effect in the acceptance rates. Whereas everything would lead you to think that girls would be getting better acceptance rates than boys. I think it's this skew created um, in the STEM and non-STEM areas. Um, but uh, one of these days on a, a spare evening I might uh, go into that in, in a bit more depth. Um, just to see what happens to um, boys and girls after they uh, graduate. graduate. Um, so there are actually um, marginally more um, men get first class degrees but actually when you put firsts and two ones together which is the kind of good degree classifications uh, females 62% um, compared to 57% um, of males <clears throat> and that starts to show through also in um, uh, graduate employment um, so female graduates about 66% are working compared to 62% of, of men um, and lower unemployment rates as well for females <clears throat> and just um, because it has been uh, in the news again uh, recently. Um, I'll just uh, divert a little if I may. Um, uh, just, sorry, those were the employment rates, I missed those. So this is a median hourly pay and I'm looking at 1997 data compared to 2010 data. Red blocks are female and grey blocks are male. So across the 1997 uh, data points, um, you'll see that uh, that men are earning more um, than women, although the gap is um, less in the, in the younger um, age groups. By the time you look at 2010, <coughs> in this young age group, 22 to 29. That's the first time you actually see females earning more than males. And of course, if you translate that back to when they were taking their GCSEs, sort of, let's say, um, in the 90s, around the time there was this big explosion in participation in higher education. So what you've seen is a kind of a time continuum where that uh, better performance of females in education, going back to... Um, the 90s is just beginning to show through um, in the labour force. So it's not very surprising that older workers and female workers who were educated much longer ago before these changes started to happen, um, and of course um, sociological changes as well, 
um, where the, the gaps are still there. So you'll still find you know, gaps in senior management because senior managers tend to be a bit older and therefore they won't have been riding on the, these educational uh, changes. Um, and, and I don't know if, it, if, you, if you've seen in the, in the papers recently, there's been quite a lot of coverage of this, of this, you know, this um, gradual, quite uh, profound, quite fundamental sociological change. And there was some data about how um, more women are marrying down or marrying equally, whereas uh, 10 or 15 years ago they'd have been marrying up. Um, and many more women being the main breadwinner in a family and returning to work after having children with the male playing more of the part of, um, of, of doing the caring and school runs and so on. Um, so quite, a, quite an interesting little detour there, I hope you think. Now, in the end, uh, we want to really look at what's happening to people from more uh, deprived backgrounds. Um, and as I said, um, participation is widening. We can, we can see that from all the data, um, but it is widening from, uh, from the bottom up. So on the next few charts, um, red are the least advantaged 20% of the population um, in the UCAS data, and blue is the most advantaged uh, 20%. Um, and this is just looking at young acceptances for higher education, again, by tariff number. So basically what you see on this chart is a higher proportion of uh, low tariff um, uh, acceptances in the more disadvantaged group and a lower proportion um, of them in the higher tariff group. And it's, it's uh, very, very plain with a sort of crossover um, just about in the middle. Um, and then if you look at sort of applicants and acceptances, and I'll give you the rates in a second, and I'll just pop this chart up. Just to show you, so remember these are equal proportions of the of the population. It's quintiles; they're twenty percent each, but you know, just a much much smaller number um, in the more disadvantaged group. But have a look now um, at the acceptance rates. So red is the more advantaged group, um, and blue is the least advantaged. Um, and you'll see that you know, right across um, a number of years, there's been that persistent gap. Uh, lower acceptance rates for those who come from more deprived uh, backgrounds. And everybody's been on a downward slope with student number controls um, coming in, although it did just peak up a wee bit um, uh, last year. Um, but you'll see also that um, in that more constrained recruitment environment, the gap um, has got a bit bigger. Um, I don't think uh, this chart will surprise you uh, very much. So this is just looking um, at um, acceptances um, by, again, by university type. Um, so, you know, surprise, surprise, the least advantage is the lowest uh, proportion in the Russell Group universities, the, the research intensive universities and the 1994 group, and a much higher proportion um, in the post-92 group and in other which would include um, mostly uh, higher education that's delivered through further education. So um, I don't like to pick on the Russell Group, um, but uh, the Russell Group is a kind of a lens through which a lot of university issues um, are looked at, and they're kind of, it's a, it's a proxy for the good universities. I, I, I personally um, have seen lots of very, very good universities that aren't in the Russell Group. Um, but for the purpose of these, I've just had a look um, at the Russell Group. Um, and, um, and so you'll see here, so the red blocks are um, Russell Group accept acceptances as a proportion um, of the total. Um, and so you see that uh, the independent schools, for example, here, about 10% um, of acceptances, um, but nearly 25% of the Russell Group intake. 40% um, from state, uh, excluding grammar schools from the state sector, only 36% of the intake uh, for the Russell Group. And here, I think this one is, um, is quite interesting. So to get into the Russell Group, you have to apply to uh, the Russell Group. And of course, there's a, an issue about who makes an application in the first place. But when they do uh, make an application, you'll see that there's a very wide divergence in acceptance rates. So the independent schools, 50% acceptance, 
rate uh, to uh, the Russell Group, whereas um, in sixth form colleges, state and so on, uh, down as far as 30%. Uh, <coughs> 